All right. <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the first gathering of this Action Circle Cycle, which is going to be led by Sheena Trait, called Appreciative Inquiry. Um, we are very excited to have Sheena present to us and to teach us about Appreciative Inquiry and, and guide us in some experiential learning so we can um, you know, know, understand how this applies to our lives. Um, Today is September 12th, 2020. It is almost the new moon, which happens on September 17th. During this time of the month and during the first gathering of the cycle, we focus on setting our intentions. It's our, you know, this is the new beginning, um, and we set our intentions for what is to come. Um, it is September, and in September, there are a lot of monthly observances. I've picked out four that I thought are really applicable to our group here. It is National Honey Month, um, and honey is a wonderful um, uh, substance in our world, matter in our, pro in our, in our world. Um, it's also Learning and Development Month, Suicide Prevention Month, and Self-Improvement Month. Um, today is also German Language Day um, and Video Game, National Video Game Day. So, um, so... You know, afterwards, if you feel like you need need some time on video games, it's your it's that time. And today is act also the end of Waffle Week, so you can also you maybe have some waffles with some honey. You didn't even know that, so get yourself some waffles. Um, <laughs> so my name is Abigail Twyman. I am joining you today from the home I share with my husband Dustin and our dog Ter Zeppelin in the community of Nockety Bay, which is located on northern Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska um, in Tlingit Ani, the land of the Tlingit people, <clears throat> which they also shared with the Haida and Tsimshian people, specifically in what is the ancestral homeland of the people of Tuxican or the to Coast Town tribe. I am honored to be able to share this space with my ancestors and the ancestors of those indigenous to the land I currently inhabit who fill my soul with the fire that fuels my action. I am dedicated to remembering forward and passing along their immense wisdom for the benefit of future generations and the protection of our shared home. I am also deeply honored to be able to share this space with all of the beautiful humans and change catalysts who have been inspired and empowered to join our pod. I am dedicated to using the privileged body I was born into and this platform to catalyze collective action. And I thank you for your commitment to acting in the service of creating peace for yourself, <clears throat> your family, your community, and all inhabitants of Mother Earth. Um, <clears throat> Um, action circles is all about learning how to have more effective conversations around challenging topics, as well as effectively collaborating with others who share our visions, mission, and values. When we come to the circle, we assume the answers to all our questions are within the circle because we have brought the right group of people together with a collective wealth of knowledge and experience. Our guiding theory is that our respective change efforts within our personal and professional lives, as well as our movements and organizations have had limited impact on the overall trajectory of the data. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to adjust our approach by bringing voices together and guiding the conversation in a new yet very old way. We have the potential to develop plans of action which are much more likely to get us to the end goal, a truly just, equitable, and peaceful world, the way it used to be and the way it always should have been. Our goal is to catalyze the spread of action circles across the world in the service of creating peace through collective action. And today, um, we are going to be ex starting our exploration of appreciative inquiry. Um, with our guide, Sheena Trait. Before we begin the, our conversation, it's important to establish our agreements that will guide us and protect us within the circle. These six agreements are the, are the starting point for action circles and they protect us within the circle. They will, they're always reviewed at the beginning of every action circle and any member can always, um, is always welcome to propose additions or modifications. Um, as I read them, I will also post them into the uh, 
post, post them into the chat. Um, so they will be there for your reference at, um, as needed. Our first agreement is that while every action circle <clears throat> will be recorded and made public, the story shared within the circle should only be shared in a way that protects, uplifts, inspires, and empowers others. The second agreement is that while we listen for understanding and are mindful of how our words and actions impact the flow of the circle and take responsibility for addressing any hurts we may cause. The third agreement is that we know that we won't solve all the complex problems overnight, but we are committed to learning and unlearning so we can be more impactful with our actions. The fourth agreement is that from time to time, we'll, we, are, we will call for a pause or silent counsel, um, and it can be called for by any member of the group, um, either in response to someone else or in response to yourself, um, by using the phrases such as waste, which stands for why am I still talking, or galmo, that's good, en good enough, let's move on. The fifth, <clears throat> the fifth agreement is that um, the chat function is reserved for contributions from those who choose typing as their preferred mode of communication and for gems or quotes that are harvested by the scribes, any of you here in the group. Um, also, you are also, you are always welcome to pass if the um, talking piece comes to you and you don't feel comfortable sharing or don't uh, at that moment, you um, can chat, you can type chat, type pass into the chat box or speak, speak the word uh, aloud. And then finally, our sixth agreement is that whenever possible, we take a pause before speaking and use sound verbal behavior, which is measured and deliberate speech when sharing our perspectives within the circle. Our introduction today, so we're going to make a, our first round of, around the circle um, to do our introductions and our um, acknowledgments. So we're um, the introduction today, so you can um, say who you are, where you're from, something, something about yourself. Um, you can share your talking piece if, um, if you would like to. Um, then you will um, share your land acknowledgement, um, acknowledge the agreements. And then the check-in question for today is, if you could transport yourself anywhere in the entire universe right now, where would you transport yourself? <clears throat> So I'm gonna, I'm going to, as you think about that, um, I will type in to the chat the, inter or the introduction components. Um, Okay, so um, I will we'll go. I can go ahead and start, and then I'll pass to um, Sheena. So my name is Abigail Twyman. I'm a humanistic behavioral scientist, creative writer, and data-driven optimist. I acknowledge I am on the ancestral and unceded territory of the indigenous peoples of Alaska, specifically Klingadani, the traditional homeland of the Klingit, Haida, and Tsimshian people. I know the indigenous peoples of this land never surrendered red lands or resources to Russia or any European nations. And I acknowledge this not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have held relationship with this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. Additionally, I acknowledge this as a point of reflection for myself and us all as we work towards dismantling colonial practices. I have heard, understood, and agree to uphold the agreements as stated. My talking piece for today um, is 
this beautiful little butterfly. And the guided meditation I have today is also about a peaceful butterfly. Um, this um, means a lot to me. Um, when my mom passed away when I was 22, um, she was cremated and part of her was put into this little charm that I carry with me. Um, and it very, touches very close to home today because we have had some losses of some moms in our community. Sorry to get emotional. Um, so my heart is a little tender. And let's see. And if I could transport, my, transport myself anywhere um, right now, it would just to be with the people who need an auntie and an anchor right now. And I would be there holding all of the people that need to be held. So with that, I will pass to Sheena. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for getting me teared up. <laughs> uh, my name is Sheena Trait. Uh, I refer to myself as a positive behavior analyst. I live in Tucson, Arizona, which is in the Sonoran Desert. Um, the southern part of the state of Arizona. And the land was originally inhabited here by the Tohono O'odham people, um, currently referred to as the Otham peoples. Uh, and I acknowledge all of the rules set forth for today. And what am I missing? I'm looking forward to today and being all and oh, um, answering your question. If I could transport myself to anywhere, where would it be? I think it would be in my garden, just in my garden and with my family around me um, planting new crops. I forgot to share my talking piece really quick. So my talking piece today, it's, um, this is a soda light. It was gifted to me on my birthday last year. Um, it's a mineral. Um, it's, it's formed underneath the surface of the earth, reminiscent of the earth itself. Um, this stone acts as a microcosm, providing clarity and confidence when dealing with life's challenges. It promotes stability and well being. I'm Mary Wong. I am an ESL instructor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, the land of the Ho-Chunk people. Uh, the university itself is built on sacred ground, sacred to the Ho-Chunk people. Um, and Bascom Hill itself is, has several burial mounds. I come from northern Wisconsin and grew up among the Menominee Indians. Uh, that's what they called themselves, the Menominee. Um, I don't have a talking piece with me today because I'm watching the birds, so I'm in my daughter's room, but I have my lovely parrot friend with me. He's not bright. He doesn't want to be on my shoulder, though. Um, uh, I acknowledge the agreements and when asked where would I like to be transported, I always think, I go to this place frequently when I meditate. Um, in 1988, I did a pilgrimage in Japan. It's called the Henro Pilgrimage, 88 Temples of Shikoku Island. And 
I don't remember at what point in the journey I arrived at this temple and it was closed or semi-deserted, but obviously well cared for. I sat on the, I sat outside the temple because the temple proper was closed and there was, the, the wood was shiny and smooth with the feet and traffic of many, many human beings. And I just sat in that place in the sunshine, in the quiet, and felt such a sense of joy and peace. And that is where I would transport myself right now if I could do that. And now I would like to hear from Alex. So I'm passing my non-talking. I'm Alex Weisenfels. I'm an eccentric existentialist philosopher and high functioning escapist. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, which was originally settled by the Ho-Chunk people. I agree to the, the agreements for the action circle. Um, I do have this, uh, my logo is the talking piece as always. And where I would go, probably the, the clear answer for me is uh, at the, I'd go to Columbus, Ohio, because I have never met my sworn brother in person. So that would be good to do. And I pass to Donna. Hi, um, I'm Donna LaCour, and I live on the Prince of Wales with Abby. And I am a children's um, behavioral health specialist. And I have um, lived here for on the island a little over 30 years and I'm ashamed to say that I really don't know much about the, um, the tribes that lived in the Thorn Bay area and I'm going to make an effort to find out because I find that important. I um, attended a Zoom class yesterday for a Lind Fellowship and they made um, a land acknowledgement and I never realized how important that was before. And so I'm gonna make that effort. Um, I quickly grabbed something for a talking piece. It's this necklace. It's, um, it's a statement of my faith, but I got the necklace. My mother sent it to me when my husband passed away. He passed away two years ago in February. And it was just, it was just, it was like my guide. It's, um, it's a Christian faith, um, necklace. And it was just my, um, my compass for when I was lost. And I've spent the last two years doing a lot of self growth, which I'm excited to be in this group for. Um, I was with my husband from the time I was 17 till I was 50. And so now I'm, I'm trying to find out who I am is just me. And I acknowledge all the, the agreements of the conversations. And if I could be transported anywhere, and as long as I get to come right back, um, we lost um, two wonderful women off our island, um, one from my community and one from Abby's yesterday. And I just really feel the need that I would love to transport to heaven and back just to have that goodbye. And I am passing on to Deepender, is that correct? Hello, hi everyone. I am Deepinder from New Jersey. I am a BCBA. I'm also a yoga and mindful meditation teacher from last 15 years, just my passion. And uh, my mentor has been my sister who has a doctorate in mindfulness in India and Vipassana meditation. So uh, real quick, we because my talking piece connects with this little story. Uh, my sister, we lost our mother. I was 28 years old and my sister was few years older than me in a car accident and she stayed in coma for 15 days and uh, that hit us hard. Uh, so she was looking for somewhere to find the internal peace and she landed with the Vipassana meditation and, uh, you know, which is a Buddhist form of meditation, but it's not connected with any 
religion sect symbol or figure it's just mindfulness because it's followed with the meditation techniques not with the religion because meditation can go both ways you know uh, which is all right not trying to judge the other ways i'm just saying what she does so my talking piece is this jewelry piece my mom gave it to me because i have a daughter and my sister has two sons so in india the jewelry it's in gold uh, 28 karat gold something uh, uh, the passing of the jewelry from family to children to children is a very important cultural part uh, they have a lot of emotional value it goes like that yeah. and you put it yes uh, since uh, you know we talked about her mom and it's funny like we are talking about our moms and donna talks and like you know how we're talking about the people so and my uh, land acknowledgement is new jersey lenny lenape indians and my land acknowledgement from india where i grew up and i'm in us from 25 years but i love being an american i have to say that it gives me the rights and freedom as a woman which india didn't give me yes i do like that uh, i can wear what i want to wear no one will tell me my skirt is too short <laughs> not that i wear short skirts i meant to say i have a right to wear it it feels good uh, i no man can tell me what to do though i'm married for 25 years so i like that that i can be myself if i want to leave my relationship i have a right to leave that right makes me feel very empowered and i really i'm i love being in america i love it i won't be anywhere else in any other country other than if it is india to be with my family i wouldn't be anywhere else so it's not much heard given what is going on in our country but i do feel that way you know that this country has and given me opportunity to be a bcba in the age of 40s how many countries can give that like they accepted me with my accent with my uh, you know late age of entering this career where most of people are very young i'm the oldest in my uh, you know company i'm the only brown one too in my company so you know. So, but I, I do love America. So many people get very surprised with it when I say that. And, but that's my experience. And there's a lot of positivity in our country. I hope our fabric stays like that because it is a beautiful country, you know? Okay. And uh, where would I be transported? I think given COVID, I would like to be transported to India so that I can meet my sister and my dad because I had a plans to go and I had to cancel that. Uh, and they can't come, I can't go there. So that's where I would like to get transported just for one day, spend time with them and come back. <laughs> and I pass the talking piece to Maximus. Thank you, Dipinder. Good morning, everyone. Sorry that I got here a little late. Uh, my name is Maximus Pepperkamp, and it's nice to be with you all. And um, I feel for you, Abby and uh, Sheena, and also Dipinder, uh, you know, the loss that you were talking about. And um, here in this area where I live, which is the land of Maidu Indians and Yana Indians, uh, there's devastating fires going on. And uh, many people, or many, yeah, quite a couple of people have lost their lives in these fires and uh, a lot of homes were burned again. And it's kind of like another terrible tragedy, which is still unfolding. If I could be at any other place, then I would be at Fort Bragg at the ocean where I can breathe some fresh air. We have been in the smoke now for about more than two weeks and it's just terrible. But um, I am um, the founder of the Sound Verbal Behavior Academy, and I am also the originator of Sound Verbal Behavior, the kind of speech that we adhere to in this uh, group. And um, just to say something briefly about that, uh, Abby, uh, you were mentioning that we're uh, addressing challenging topics. And I would like to make a brief remark on that that when we talk about challenging topics, we are actually talking about the fact that we have difficulty talking about things and there are no challenging topics. 
there are there is only our way of talking which either makes it possible for us to talk about things or not and so having said that um you know um i um of course i acknowledge the um the agreements and um um let me see what else i would like to say oh here this is my talking piece the little the little vase from uh, from holland i'm from holland originally and um um yeah that's about it for now i look forward to today's meeting and uh, thank you then i go back to abby right yeah yes thank you for that and i was just going to type that in so the topics aren't the challenge it's the way that we approach the conversations i like that wording so we'll i'll change that around a little bit thanks that for that maximus yeah. so our talking piece today not our talking piece sorry um our centerpiece today is an image that was shared by Sheena. Let's see if it's coming up. There we go. Okay. So here is an image that was the image that was shared by Sheena. Um, so when we come to circle in, in person, there is often more than one or more items placed in the center of the circle to serve as a focal point. And the power of the circle is that opposed to common approaches to um, conversations, which um, often turn can turn into power struggles and have difficulty with communication, speaking and listening. Um, here we speak from the rim of the circle into the center and our voices have equal power um, because we all have something very important to contribute. Um, Sheena, would you like to tell us a little bit about this centerpiece and what it means to you? Sure. Um, I chose this for our centerpiece today for many reasons. Uh, one, because we're going to be talking about change and we're going to be speaking about positive change and how it leads to growth. And so this is a painting that my aunt made for me. Painting, yes, uh, she did this with paints. Uh, you can see her name. Um, again, it was a, a birthday gift last year. And it's very captivating. And it's from nature. And to me, this symbol is representative of both growth and how um, of, uh, it's representative ch of change and how that can lead to growth. Awesome, thank you, Sheena. So I will actually, Put that, put that image back up on the screen. Um, and I, am, I have a um, guided visualization, guided meditation to lead you all through before we get started into our discussion. So if you could find, your, find yourself a, co um, a comfortable seated position and with your feet on the floor, if that's comfortable, your back straight and tall, shoulders back. And I invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze. And let's together take three cleansing breaths. We'll breathe in deeply through our nose and fill our bellies and our chests, and then let it out with a sigh. Breathe in and let it out. <sighs> Breathe in again and fill yourself up. <sighs> and sigh it out. And one more time. Breathe in. And sigh it out. <sighs> 
And as you find, as you continue to breathe gently and naturally with your eyes closed or relaxed, I want you to let, I want to invite you to let the sights and sounds of the room you're in fade away as you focus on your breathing and get ready to visualize a fun and relaxing adventure. Your body begins to feel deeply relaxed and sink down further wherever you are. Your arms and your legs begin to feel very heavy. And, you're pa and you patiently enjoy this time as your mind and your body begin to relax. Now I invite you to imagine that you are a beautiful butterfly fluttering high in the sky. <clears throat> and below you, there is a lovely green valley with lots of colorful flowers just waiting for you to enjoy. You can feel the wind gently blowing against your delicate wings. And as the wind touches you, it gently blows away any worries and any stress you may feel. Your mind is clear and calm. You feel light as the wind itself, a cheerful butterfly gliding and fluttering anywhere you wish to go. Did you know that as a butterfly moves from flower to flower, it spreads just what the plants need to thrive and grow? You are like that too. You can flutter about peacefully and beautifully, spreading kindness, happiness, and goodness wherever you go. The sun touches your colorful body and warms you. The big puffy clouds floating in the sky remind you how relaxed and calm you can be whenever you want, just by thinking about it. It is so nice to be this light and airy. Your butterfly self has left any worries or fears behind. You love how it feels to beat your wings and fly. And anytime you start to feel a little tired, you can land on a leaf or a flower and rest. Now I invite you to spread your lovely wings in a huge stretch and you are completely and peacefully content as you allow your true happiness to shine through. It feels so good and your body is calm and your mind is peaceful. You can fly around as long as you'd like, exploring or just gently floating on the wind. Now I invite you to take a deep breath in and exhale slowly. <clears throat> and when you're ready, give your body another big stretch and slowly open your eyes. And as you're doing that, think about what did you like best about being a butterfly? Keep that feeling with you as long as you can and remember, you can always come back here or to any calming place just by using your mind. Oh. So now that we're all feeling centered and focused, I will pass the talking piece to Sheena to tell us all about Appreciative Inquiry. Thank you, Abby. And I have to say, I'm, I am still getting used to the fact that I need to 
past the talking piece after I'm done talking, so I'll try and get better about that. Uh, I just sort of end talking my, you know, whatever I'm saying, and then the next person's like, anyway. Okay, so yes, uh, I think before uh, I jump into this, I think I'll just kind of pose a question to get us going. Uh, let's just uh, think about something this week. Just reflect upon something this week that went well and why. And you can type it in the chat. Uh, actually, that's probably better if we just kind of uh, take maybe two minutes and then just type it in the chat. Something this week that went well and why you think it went well. Deep hinder. I used calming methods for my anxiety and they made a difference. Why? Practice helped. Beautiful. Abby had an open and honest discussion with the leadership team with my district to address rising concerns. Didn't let the negative sit inside, let it out. Felt hard, felt heard, made a collaborative plan and feel supported. Amazing, great, awesome. Donna, the weekly staff meeting I led went very well. It's because instead of winging it, I prepared an agenda and was purposeful in what I wanted to relate. Nice. Mary, I helped a grad student prepare for high, a high stakes presentation she has next Tuesday. I think it went well because she had clear goals she was able to share with me and also because she was so grateful for the time I was spending with her. Maximus, I wrote, recorded a lecture, um, I, which is what I like to do before I didn't want to record lectures. Excellent. And Alex, helping some clients at work went particularly well because I was able to figure out exactly what they needed. So that feels good. Uh, Wonderful, thank you all for sharing with that. I like to start with what's, what's, um, what's good. Um, sometimes with chaos and all around us and challenging things, uh, it's kind of hard to uh, see what's good. We have this negativity bias and that's just evolutionarily how we're built to survive. And so I always like, um, and that's what I love about, yes, that's what I love about appreciative inquiry is because you start from a place of strengths. You start from a place of what's working rather than, oh man, this is really overwhelming. This is an issue, this is an issue. This is really hard. I don't know what I'm gonna do about this. And instead we take that 
and we flip it and turn it into something intentional and generative and thoughtful and we move toward that which is meaningful to us. So that's why I like to start with something that is a little bit, you know, it gets us all connected also on what's going on in each other's lives. So um, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about change. Um, so here's some things that are true about human change. It's essential. It enables us to learn and grow. Control is an illusion. To a behavior analyst, that could be hard to hear. But if you keep an open mind, you'll understand why you can see that that also exists, but also that we can control other things. Change is actually a messy and a magical process at the same time. It can't be contained. It creates ripples at the me level, the we level, and the us levels across a system. And I'll define what a system is in a little bit. It's never complete. Change is continuous and it is constant all the time. Change all the time. Context counts. Different types of changes require different types of approaches. Now let's look at some things that are true about positive change. Positive change, and we're looking, about, we're looking at positive change. It helps us grow toward the positive and the possible. Don't you love that? Helps us grow towards the positive and the possible. It improves our confidence to navigate and thrive in the mess and the magic. It builds pathways that improve change buy-in and success. It equips leaders with the skills they need to solve complex problems. So here's some things that um, are some myths that might be counter to what you might think or believe about or how you might define change. Uh, so myths, typically we develop these to help us make sense of a senseless world, right? So that's why I wanted to change some of the, or that's why I wanted to share some of these myths associated with change. Uh, myth number one, 70% of change is unsuccessful. Not true. Myth number two, the pace of change is burning people out. Myth number three, leaders need to create and communicate a change vision. Not necessarily. Myth number four, change needs to be controlled. Myth number five, change is successful when outcomes endure. So I just wanted to see, uh, I'm wondering how that's sitting with people. if you maybe had beliefs about change and how it works, um, some of those things might be like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, over time, uh, you might let those sink in, you know, like maybe I'll type them out or something or share them with you guys. Uh, so with that, um, let's see what else that I wanted to share. Let's see. Okay. 
so this is what I like about positive change and why I wanted to bring attention to the fact that um, most human systems, both at the me level, the we level, and the us levels, spend 80% of their time and resources focusing on what needs fixing and only 20% of their time and resources on building on their strengths. So to think about it differently, in order to make systems flourish, we have to reverse that. The equation needs to be reversed. Why? The primary response to the negative in the absence of positive tends to be threat, rigidity, and protection rather than positive change. And then as evolution would have it, spotting threats as an adaptive advantage in certain contexts where we're just getting by and surviving. Um, so let's start with uh, another question. And this is where we can use our talking pieces. And I want to talk about a pilgrimage. And I believe it was Mary, you shared a pilgrimage at the outset. I was like, yes, perfect. Uh, and the thing about pilgrimages. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of examples so that we can get a little bit of a taste of, of, of what we're looking for here. So despite their religious underpinnings and overtones, a pilgrimage is a journey, often into an unknown or foreign place where a person goes in search of a new or expanded meaning about the self, others, nature, or a higher good. It can lead to transformation after which the pilgrim returns to their daily life changed. For example, the Salt March in 1930 was an act of nonviolent civil disobedience in colonial India led by Gandhi. The 24 day pilgrimage across 240 miles of India was a direct action campaign against Britain's Salt Act of 1882 which prohibited Indians from collecting or selling salt, a staple of their diet. Gandhi started this march with 80 people, but along the way he addressed large crowds in every town. And by the time he reached the coastal town, town of Dandi on the Arabian Sea, tens of thousands of people had joined his pilgrimage. Together they made salt from sea water defying British policy. And as a result, nearly 60,000 people, including Gandhi, were arrested. But the pilgrimage forced British leaders to acknowledge Gandhi as a leader they could neither suppress or ignore. India was finally granted its independence in 1947. So, Pilgrims choosing a learning journey into the unknown as they're summoned to walk miles upon miles through the urban jungle, jungle internalize the rhythm of their city. They're driven to trace the steps of their ancestors guided by an untraditional atlas, discovering where past and present converge. Or they're called to be a change agent and champion change agents and champions who sense that there is a different or better tomorrow. The modern pilgrim will blaze a trail of kindness, independent of the goodwill of others, or seek out what that which is crumbling in an effort to change it. You don't have to bring along a prayer book or go on a pilgrimage. All it takes is a strong intention, focus, and a heart open to transformation. 
So I would like everyone to share their best pilgrimage experience. Take a couple of minutes to think about it. And in this change, in this pilgrimage that you took, in this change, what was the mess? And what was the magic? And what made it so memorable to you? And if you want, um, Abby, I don't know if you want me to share mine or just give everyone a couple of minutes to um, think on this for a second before we, we start talking. Yeah, I think it would, I, yeah, I think it would be good to just, let's give us a few minutes of um, silent counsel, some silent reflection as we kind of think about the story that we want to share. Um, and then we'll have you start, start us out with your story as a model, and then we'll go from there. Okay, I'll let you kind of uh, let us know when it's time to share. Can, can we see the um, prompt in the chat? I'll write it down, yes. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So feels like it that's probably had enough time to kind of organize our thoughts. So Sheena, go ahead and get us started. 
All right, I'll go ahead and start. So this pilgrimage thing, it can be a long time ago. It can be in the recent past. It doesn't really matter when. Um, so for me, about uh, if this was last at the end of last year, and I wanted to further my education in a deeper way, and it was an ACT boot camp, um, Abby. But this boot camp was in Florida, and I'm in Arizona. And I have a fear of flying and also traveling by myself. And I've never been away from my family for longer than a couple of days. Uh, so all of that was incredibly anxiety inducing for me. But going to this event um, I knew was going to strengthen and deepen uh, my professional knowledge and result in professional growth, but also personal um, wisdom and growth as well. So it was incredibly meaningful to me. So I, for two days, sat with what was there and I said, all right, fear, you're gonna come with me on this trip, but you're not going to boss me around or tell me what I can and can't do because this is meaningful to me. So I'm gonna get on that plane, I'm gonna do this on my own when I'm at the thing, I am not going to hibernate in my hotel room. I'm going to go down. I'm going to talk to people. And I did. And I was sitting in the airport uh, on my way home. I was sitting at the airport before I got on my flight home. And I wrote myself a letter. And I essentially said, look at what you did. If you could do this, you could do this again. And you can do harder things too. So I wrote a letter to myself because it was hard for me, but I did it and it was so worth it. And I'm going to pass along to Mary. And I'm going to talk about that literal pilgrimage, which was perhaps one of the most experiences of in my life, important experiences of my life. I started uh, out on this trip with the idea that this is a cool bike trip. I enjoy biking on Shikoku. I've visited a couple temples. This will be fun. And within a couple of days, I had bought the robe that identifies me as a pilgrim, and I had committed in a much different way than I expected to commit to the experience. I was between, I was leaving a job in which I had learned a lot and which I loved very much, but which had a lot of tension and um, perhaps too many, too high expectations um, attached to it. And I felt both sad and happy about that. I was going to be moving to the United States for the first time in seven years to spend some time with my family. Um, and I didn't have a plan after that. And so I was in a position where I kind of didn't know what I was doing with my life right at that point. Um, but I think that the, the mess and what was most important to me in the pilgrimage was going from here, I'm going to take a bike trip and I, it was letting go of that control and saying, um, I'm in the mountains and 
So there's all that metaphor associated with mountains too. Like I was literally climbing mountains and then you'd lock your bike and you'd like climb some more mountain and you'd get to this place of peace and contemplation, which were, were the individual temples. And you would sit with that. But even more important was the people that I met along the way became so important because one of the things you do as a pilgrimage is that you, you're supposed to throw yourself on the mercy of others. If someone offers you something to eat or to drink, you're not supposed to refuse it. That was really hard for me. I was a very independent young woman. You know, I'd lived in China, I'd lived in Japan. I could do anything I, on my own. And with the pilgrimage, I abandoned that principle about myself that I was this independent person and I accepted help from other people. And sometimes it was literally life-saving. Like I begged for help on a couple of occasions because I was in a bad situation and I needed help. And so um, I think the unknown for me was that making myself that vulnerable to other people, strangers in particular, and the incredible gifts that followed from that. The, not just, you know, the tangerines and the occasional can of beer from a truck driver and, <laughs> um, you know, the bottles of water, but the, the advice and the conversations and the vulnerability that other people then shared. Um, so I'm looking at what I'm supposed to include here. Yeah, I also was, I was raised Catholic. I had been very involved in all of that. And then as soon as I left the United States, I was like, wait, no, I'm an atheist. And I, it was a very sudden realization. And, and it took a long time to come to terms with that because when you go from being a a cradle Catholic who went through all through school and like church was a central part of your life to have that all fall away. You've lost your community, the community that you've grown up in. And so I had been very resistant to exploring other religions and um, Buddhism opened up for me in a way that was like, hey, you could be an atheist and also be this spiritual person too. So that was another aspect of like going on a literal pilgrimage was was kind of being forced up against that um that i didn't have to abandon spirituality just because i no longer believed in a christian god and i will pass the talking piece to alex so I was kind of racking my brain trying to figure out what example to include because I've been places, I've gone on some some trips, but never with the purpose of learning more because I've never felt like going somewhere else has been necessary to to broaden my horizons by that much. A lot of things I, I can get out of books. But then I realized that's the way, the reason I feel that way is because just the the world in general, just human society in general is already a foreign place to me. I've uh, very rarely actually felt like, like there was a place that, that I was uh, somehow native to that I had originated from. So it's not a very visually evocative journey, but you know, my, my whole life I've been on some kind of pilgrimage trying to figure out what, what am I? What are other people? What are they doing and why? And there's a lot that I've learned, but there's a lot that I still need to learn. I've been observing 
so much all this time and I know why people do things, but I don't know why they don't like I don't know how to put this. It's kind of like the weather where when something happens, you can immediately say, oh, yes, I know why that happened. It's because of this chain of events. But then you realize that that ignores all of the other factors that could just as easily have pushed something the other way. You don't really know why those factors didn't play as much of a role in pushing something to a different outcome. So being able to, to understand those, that's not just a matter of theory. That's a matter of practice and calibration, spending the actual time with people and, and in the, the communities that, they, that they've created to figure out not just what all there is, but how important things are relative to each other for different people in different contexts at different times. And that's going to take more work, but I do know that it's not, it's not cut and dried. It's not static. There's always, um, not just nuance, but it's, it's interactive. It, it changes as you interact with it. And so I'm going to need to do a bit more of that because it's, Seeing what happens is, it's one of those things where you have to play a role in order to figure out what, what it's like. I'm trying to, to capture it in a sentence here. The, the last, maybe not the last lesson, but the last type of lesson is one that does not exist until you are learning it. If that makes sense, because it's, it's creating the world that you're learning about. Yeah, I think that's about what I'm learning. And I'll pass the talking piece to Donna. Um, <laughs> I had no idea what to share. Um, I, I'm not, first off, I'm not a very wordy person and, um, and I struggle really hard sharing things personal. And I was like, I have no pilgrimage that I've gone through. I couldn't imagine anything to share, but, um, nice thing about not going first is hearing other people's examples. Um, I would say a pilgrimage I've, I've been going through and I'm like still on is, um, accepting that I have the same value as everybody else. In my present position, I have to attend meetings with people that have master's degrees and so forth. And then I have just a tiny bit of college. And I always am hesitant about speaking up. And um, one of the professors from my classes last fall talked me into doing this Lind Fellowship. And I've spent all summer long just in a panic over it because I applied and I interviewed and I got um, accepted and I just kept it's not going to happen. It's just I'm just not the right stuff. And then I had the two day seminar on Thursday and Friday and it was like, oh, my gosh, now I'm in the seminar and most of the people there have master's degrees. And, and if they don't have master's degrees, most of them are like second, third, fourth year college. And so, and I was just like, everything that's going to come out of my mouth is going to be stupid. And, and it wasn't, and it's like, okay, so I, I guess I did measure up and I don't know if I'm answering this quite correctly. I have a feeling there's no right and wrong to this, but, um, it's, it's growth that as each meeting that I have to tend to for my job, um, I don't have to sit there and be afraid to share is that. So, um, and what was the other part? I think I, oh, what makes this so memorable is I can go forth <laughs> and um, 
hopefully advance in my profession and, and make impact into the lives of the children that I work with. So, and I'm going to pass the talking stiff on. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Uh, so the pilgrim, I can't say that word right because English is my third language. So some words doesn't matter how I try. I'll try again. Pilgrimage. Did it sound right? Okay. <laughs> like some words, it doesn't matter how I try. They just, uh, you know, my children try very hard to break it down for me. And they will say, if my children will be teaching me, they will say, mom, say, Anyway. <laughs> I would say is my journey as a behavior analyst uh, because I this I become a behavior analyst at the age of 43. I'll be turning 50 this year on November 20th, and uh, so I'm very excited about it. Uh, I have a law degree in India. I have my undergrad in sociology and psychology. Then I did a master's of education here in US and uh, before I did many courses in the county college so that I don't have to do undergrad here again and then a master's in ABA. So I did all that but even when I become a BCBA I felt that I'm not a real BCBA people will get to know that like it almost felt like I'm faking it because I wasn't sure about myself. I was in a uh, new field at a much older age and with knowing that uh, you know I'm different I have an accent uh, you know I'm brown in a field where there are very less people who are in that demographics and I felt almost good two years that imposter syndrome that's something in ACT they talk about too and I truly felt it I will go into the house all confident in my heart, I'm thinking, client will know I'm fake. Like, <laughs> my RBT will think that, you know, oh, the pinder doesn't know anything. Oh, you, know, well, you know, how come she knows? And uh, I think so the, the most mess about it was it took me, I wasted. I won't say wasted, but I, like, it, two years were really rough on me as a BCBA. And I overdid work, which affected my personal life, my marriage, because I was so focused on being a good BCBA that I let my other pieces of personal life fell apart, didn't give them as attention as I should have given it. And because I was in a foreign place, you know, that wasn't my career choice. When you are 25, you have more energy with your body and mind. Uh, but the what came out of good was I, I loved my clients and I loved my families. And when I made a little change or when I helped the RBT uh, improve on the skill and their text or the parents text and that, that was like magical. So I do know now uh, this, if life would have been different, I would have been a behavior analyst right from the beginning. And it, it is, it is my true path. Like I will do it for free, even if someone not pays me, which I'm doing a lot of work in India right now um, uh, with a couple of families and uh, I, I will do it for free. And that's how I know that that journey of pilgrimage was, it is my journey. This is my pilgrimage. I still messed up pilgrimage. It's fine. <laughs> okay. I pass the talking piece to Maximus. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking immediately a pilgrimage of a time when I was uh, uh, still relatively young and uh, I was not married yet, but I was already with my wife and um, uh, we, we didn't have a car at the time. And so we traveled with a train to uh, Italy from Holland and, um, and we wore backpacks you know, and um, and we got off the train and we went to some in a bus to some sort of village in the in the Italian Alps. Uh, I think it was somewhere near Madonna di Campiglio, if you've ever heard of that name. Beautiful Italian Alps. And uh, 
we came at a campsite and there was hardly any place on the campsite. It was just so full with people. It was at the high season and we took a real chance, but somehow there was a little spot where we could put our tent and um, we put our tent there and, um, and we suddenly started looking around and there's all these couples there. And uh, there, was a, there was a couple from Germany. I still remember the name, Frigurt and Marie, Anne-Marie and, uh, from Germany. And there was an English couple. And there was, a, um, and there was the, then me and my wife. My wife is, by the way, a, a Chinese-American. And so, uh, and then there were, of course, there were Italians. There were, there were, there were like three Italian couples, and they were just screaming, and they were loud, and and you know, there's like there's really cultural differences there. These British, they were really kind of like calm, and so and the Italians, they were just very talkative and stuff like that. Anyway, there was all these couples there uh, close by, and we just sort of got to connect it, and we decided that we were going to climb the mountain together. <laughs> With, all, with I think some like eight couples or something, it's like crazy. And and lo and behold, there was a trail that sort of started uh, uh, somewhere in, and there was also some sort of a little chapel way. They have that in Italy. They have these little chapels where you go along these different chapels. And it's kind of like also they used to do that as some sort of a, a pilgrimage. Anyways, but we went way above that because we went all the way to the top and all these couples, they were all moaning and complaining and they were, they were arguing and people got blisters and, and, uh, and my wife and I, we are pretty good uh, mountaineer. Uh, well, we, we have done that a couple of times. So we were kind of used to walking in the mountains, taking long hikes, but many of these couples, they were totally not, they had no idea what they got themselves into. So we went all the way up there and, and it was like exhausting and everybody was just like, I don't know, we had to stop multiple times and drink water and I don't know, couples got into fights and all that. And then finally we were making it down with all of us. It was like, it was like a big event. And then when we were down at the campsite, we were, we were eating together and drinking together and it was just really great. It was like, it was like, a, it was like a moment in time that we were with, all these couples and and was, oh oh and, the, and that German couple there was this German couple I, f I never forget they start talking about the, the the Second World War and and uh, feeling really bad about the fact that their ancestors had done that and so a whole conversation about Europe with the British and with the Italians and with the it was really interesting uh, like culturally speaking how all of that got sort of and everybody said, no, that's, yeah, you have no, they felt guilty, you know, about that. And, and uh, yeah, no, yeah. But the Italians, they were just so joyful and they were so screamy. <laughs> and everybody started to get also loud and so forth. And people at the campsite were complaining because we were making too much noise and stuff like that. But anyway, we had a great time. And it was kind of like a pilgrimage that we had to go all the way up and down on the mountain together with all these couples. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And it's nice to think back on that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I, you know, moving, moving back to Alaska to me was like the start of my great pilgrimage that I'm still kind of in, in the, in the midst of, but I feel like, you know, kind of, found my, found my purpose but one one story that comes to mind of kind of that like in the midst of you know my transformation I moved up here had lots of you know unexpected things happen um and I had been um reading some about act acceptance and commitment therapy and you know promoting it wanting people to learn more about it but I had I hadn't actually done the work yet, um, <clears throat> and Dustin and I had the opportunity to caretake at a lodge out on an island, a remote island, um, and that's like this lodge is 
um, like all by itself in a bay on an island that has no other like houses or anything on it. So it's very private, very protected. Um, and I took out there with me the um, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life book by Steve Hayes, which is the work, uh, you know, personal self-help workbook. And, you know, every day I would wake up and um, read, the, you know, read a couple pages and there's exercises in there, you know, written reflections and everything. And so like this whole time, you know, we've spent a couple months out there where I'm like, you know, engaging in lots of self-reflection and, um, you know, digging, like digging really down deep and, um, you know, exploring kind of, you know, what, what were my, you know, what were my, my barriers? Where, where am I fused? What are the things that I need to do? Um, and how can I, you know, move forward from this? Um, and it was just, it was an, ex an experience that happened very, at the very end of our trip that was like, um, you know, it was like the epitome of get out of your mind and into your life, like get present. So here in, you know, remote places in Alaska, waste management is a challenge. So many people, you know, we kind of separate things into things that are burnable, um, you know, and then other recyclables. So at the end of our, and end of our um, stay there, you know, the, the owners of the lodge are preparing to come back and um, we've got to get, you know, we've got some trash, we've got to get burned, but we're in the, like in the middle of a bay. And so you have to take a little boat, little rowboat and go to the shore and take with the garbage and um, burn it. And so, you know, Dustin's Dustin's there at the lodge, but he's inside working. And so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go. I'll go take this trash out there. Um, but it's a little windy, and um, you know, you'd think it would be really quiet, but it's gen the power is generator run, so it's kind of a loud place. So anyway, so I row out and I burn the trash and. I get ready to come back, but the wind is blowing into the bay. And so like, I'm trying to row back to the lodge <laughs> and the wind is blow keeps blowing me back. And I, you know, I have like a history of back injuries. And so like my back is hurting and I'm rowing, like rowing as hard as I can row, row, you know, rowing my boat. And like, I keep getting closer and closer. And like, I'm almost to the lodge and then the wind picks up and it blows me back to shore. And so I start hollering for Dustin to like, I, I don't know what he's going to do to help me, but it's like, I need help. I'm, I'm stuck out here. My, I'm, my arms are hurting. Everything's hurting. I can't do this, you know? And so I'm like screaming, I'm whistling and he's not, you know, not coming out. The generator's really loud, so there's lots of, and the wind's blowing, so, you know, there's lots of conflicting noises, and so I just start, like, I am just, like, bawling, because I'm, like, I'm in pain, I got to get to the lodge, the wind's blowing me, I'm also, like, you know, dealing with all this emotional stuff that has come up that I've been, you know, kind of working through, and it's, like, this is just the story of my life, I just keep rowing and rowing, <laughs> the wind keeps pulling me back, and so, like I find myself like blown up against the shore and like stuck on the, so, like literally stuck on the rocks. And Dustin finally comes out because he's like, what, where is she? He's like, she's just been out there to go burn the trash. And finally it was like, you know, came out and, you know, I'm, I'm just like still hysterical sobbing. And he's like, why don't you grab the rope? <laughs> There's a rope from the lodge, like tied to the shore to like keep it stable there. And it was literally just like in the water. All I had to do was just like grab the rope and pull myself back to shore. And um, it was, you know, it was just like it, I was like in my tears had to laugh because I was like, yeah, that's like the story of my life. I'm like so all up in my head and like panicking and trying to get trying to get somewhere. And like all you needed to do was just slow down, take a look around, and realize that you have all that you need right here to get where you need to go. So that was my kind of my my personal <laughs> my personal emotional pil pilgrimage and um kind of a, a funny a funny thing that sticks with me now where I'm just like slow down, grab the rope, you're going to be okay. <laughs> so
Wow, you all. Thank you for sharing your pilgrimages with me. Uh, you know, we are built for change. Uh, and these pilgrimages are just sort of snapshots of uh, sometimes pivotal points in our lives where chaos is happening and we're having epiphanies and we're growing and that's that's you know i i i took a little bit from all of you so thank you so much for sharing with me um from your life i know it's it's a little bit of a personal thing uh, but very relevant to this and i want to make sure that there's this like safety established with this group you know it's it's called psychological safety you know like we're all here we're just you know doing our lives <laughs> you know some of us are struggling some of us are you know and it's just this like thing like this all the time so um again thank you so much for sharing your stories with me um Let's talk about uh, appreciative inquiry now. So oftentimes when a system is in a state of struggle, as I mentioned before, um, and you'll see this in leaders, uh, especially in like maybe, for example, a big company. Um, when the you know what hits the fan, uh, we have a tendency to want to control more. Like I'm the leader, so I need to figure out what I need to do to get things going and fix stuff. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll give you an I'll give you a really quick example. You know, um, uh, you know, I was working for a, a company and COVID hit and. Yes, it had a, a huge impact on the company, just like it had this had a, this pandemic has had a huge impact on everyone um, and a bunch of businesses. And I remember they sent out, uh, you know, here's a phone number you can call if you need to talk to someone. And that's great. But I remembered thinking, how great would it be if leaders came and invested in uh, the, the people who are the backbone of the company by personally making contact with them and asking, how are you traveling, my friend, through this? And what can we do together? As opposed to feeling going to panic mode and feeling like, okay, I need to fix this. I need to get us going in the right direction. These numbers need to go up. But when we're experiencing a very challenging uh, moment uh, or experience, sometimes we just need people to be with us. And that is much more valuable to than any money you can give anyone. If you're working for a company where there's high stress, um, you're working very, very hard, burnout is pretty prevalent, um, I can guarantee you that you're not so interested in the money. You're doing it for the reasons why you're doing what you're doing, right? And Deepender, thank you. Bye. And um, so taking a moment and seeing the perspective from, uh, you know, the middle of the company and, and in on a very, you know, personal level 
is going to be much more worth much more than money, you know, or um, a phone number. Uh, so the reason why I say that is because this appreciative inquiry process, it's a tool that can be used to leverage strengths. So when there is chaos and mess, it teaches us that struggle and magic and amazing things can happen simultaneously. Um, and that we live and that words create worlds. Meaning if we ask just the right questions, we can shift the way things are going to go. So, um, appreciative inquiry. Let me look at the time. Okay. So what we're going to do, I think, um, cause we only have a little bit, we have 20 minutes left. I'm going to briefly define appreciative inquiry. And then I think what we'll start to do is we'll start, uh, focusing on the, one of the first steps of appreciative inquiry. Okay. So, AI, it's a, a tool that focuses on um, A systems. So a system is me. It's, so it can be yourself, something going on in your life. It can happen at the we. So that's like, you know, me and you, um, or like, you know, a group of people within a, a particular school or something, and then the us, which is like this big picture um, perspective, can have a system, system can be one of those. So I think there's, so what we do is we start with uh, a place of strengths rather than seeking to overcome or minimize weaknesses. So it's an invite and inquire approach, which brings together diverse stakeholders so that they can explore generative strengths focused questions and self organize around values based action. And you do this through this, this, um, you know, 6D framework, which is define. So in the define stage, you're defining what positive change do you want to create for yourself, your workplace, your family, and what do we want to, or what do we want to grow together? The discover phase is shining a light on what the, what's, what's the best of what is, what's currently here and what's good about it. What's, what has worked well previously for us. And we really take a look at that. The dream stage a very fun uh, piece and it's very idealistic. This is where you throw the rules out the window and you're like, in a perfect world, what would this look for like? What would this look like? So what could be by opening up your mind and becoming idealistic? If this positive change went as well as it could, what would success look like for you, for us? Okay. And then there's the design phase, which is where we start to talk about what are the actionable steps needed to get to where you would like to be, or perhaps how you'd like to be. And you co-create. Uh, and then what are the different pathways that you could help um, you and then together make this positive change a reality. And then the deploy phase, which is an actionable commitment. There's a lot of overlaps with ACT here. An actionable commitment for what your next steps need to be and how to keep them drumming like a drum roll, like a drum roll, 
Like, so we're not just making it an action. How do we keep this action flowing in our lives? How do we keep, how are we going to be accountable for the change that we committed to through this whole process? So um, it's where values come into play. Um, and it's where you take ownership. Um, so there's two things. If we can do this today, um, Abby, I'm going to, it, I don't know if I can share my screen really quick. Yeah, you should be able to. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, here we go. Okay, so here's where we're at right now, okay? But before we do this, we have to think about hey, Sheena, systems. I don't, I don't think you're sharing what yeah. you think you're sharing. We see uh, sure. your file system. Do you see uh, define? No. Nope. On here? No, nope. go to the, your share screen again and make sure the right uh, window is was selected. Okay. Here it is. Uh, okay. Did that work? Yep. There you go. Okay. So this is where we're at people right here. Um, we're at this defined place, but before this, we have to think about, we have to take a few minutes. I would say, let's take like three minutes to, or actually um, we can quickly, uh, I'm trying to think, it might be better to just type in the chat. Everyone just type this in the chat so that we can get all sorts of things down because it'll be more efficient. Um, Think about all the different systems you're a part of. Organizations, teams, professional groups, family, community, you yourself. Um, any of these things. And let's just type out all the thing, all the different kinds of systems that we are a part of that are meaningful to us. And then what you're going to want to do is hone in on one of those that's most meaningful to you today. Which system would you want to focus on making positive change happen? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put some, some um, you know, is it a change you want to make in your organization? Is it a change you want to make in your community? Is it a change that you would like to see happen within a team, uh, within your family? So starting to think about that. Um, what other what other systems are we in? You know, we are citizens of the world. We're in educational systems. global community. My community, okay, so it sounds like, Abby, you're pretty honed in on this focus is gonna be, your system focus is going to be on your community and the school district in particular. My 
my global community of effective altruists. Love it. Meaningful change in the classes I teach. Yes. And the world and thoughtful people in, in particular. Love it. So yeah, so we're part of all these different systems in the world. And for us to do this, we're going to get personal. We're going to get into something that is meaningful to you in your life. And the first step is defining a problem that you want to solve within your system. Um, this visual that I have here, this is our define phase. So maybe next week, or maybe even right now, uh, but it, we start with, um, you name it. So what is it? You name the problem, okay? And then we flip it. And all of this, you're gonna be like, well, how do I do that? We'll, we'll start with this next week. And then we frame it. And that's the fun part. And that will be our topic of the beginning. Bye, Mary. Of our positive change. So maybe we go through and I don't know if anyone has thought of um, what is something, let's just start with this first question and we'll end with everyone maybe naming something they would like to grow in their system. So Mary, oh, okay, so people are just going to type in the, in, in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and, um, Alex, I'm going to start with you, and we'll just name them verbally. Uh, responsibility. And should I elaborate? Yeah. Oh, okay. And responsibility in what system? Oh, um, responsibility in people it's kind of coming from, from two directions. People who care about the way that things go need to be responsible so that they can see what problems are coming up, understand those problems and what they can do about them and then actually uh, take some effort to address them. It's, I'm not gonna say it out loud, it's, it's kind of like a step behind what we're talking about right here. Um, but responsibility mindset is a rather difficult and complicated mindset to use, but um, understanding the cumulative actions that we need to take in order to make things the way we want them to be and then proactively uh, 
taking those actions on a regular basis. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so what I'm hearing is that um, you would like to see the responsibility mindset from more people in general mm -hmm. in the world. Right. Yeah, I guess. And so the problem is not using mm -hmm. um, um, people not taking responsibility or recognizing or not understanding. Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Um, I guess contributions. Um, I like more people, including myself, to be better about actively contributing to to hold things together and to build the future. Okay, so more engaged human beings. Got it. Who's next? Um, I can I can jump in. I was just I was just sharing. Uh, Donna had shared some things in text I, that I re, uh, put in there as well. Um, so for me, so my focus is really on kind of our little family of a community here in Nockety Bay, and then more broadly within our school district. Um, you know, wanting to help grow the resilience and mobility within our team um, of educators and then also within our families um, and the children. Um, and because we have, you know, on top of everything else that's going on in the world, we have a some pretty um we some have some pretty heavy stuff to deal with as a, as a family. And we are, I mean, this small island community is a very um, big extended family. And so, you know, doing my part, doing my part to kind of, you know, be a model and be an anchor um, for those who need it most is kind of where, where, where my heart is right now. Abby, if you could prioritize one thing from the plethora of struggles that your community is being faced with right now, what would that be? I think it's really, to me, where I keep going is reconnection, reconnection with each other and reconnection with the land. Um, you know, we've all been very kind of very busy trying to kind of trying to get school and education back into into the groove and right now it feels like you know a good time to take a time out and go outside and work you know focus on healing ourselves as opposed to forcing ourselves into something that doesn't feel quite right Got it. Anyone else want to share something that they're thinking? Maxis? Yeah. Um, awesome. So, yeah, I was thinking about uh, moving forward, you know, um, as, a, as just a, a focal point, uh, but also creating perspective you know long-term goals which sort of just pull us through this and choices that need to be made in terms of we got to continue with education got to continue to plow along and uh, motivation um, just enhancing that any possible way connecting people with resources that we have at school you know I'm doing a lot of that <laughs> because yeah we do have a whole bunch of resources and uh, I students need to just know that they can go there and they can get some help, you know, and if they do it, yeah, then, then, then they will perhaps even get some money or some other resources that the school has. So 
but then and and then also yeah in the class itself just just being part of the class you know whenever you can and uh, uh, just creating that sense of community that continuity which which helps people to um, yeah to just to get through this difficult time we are going through a really rough period here in in Butte County and um, um, and yeah you know if it, but but life goes on you know regardless and 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 as an educator i just want to focus on moving forward and 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 being together in that process also with 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 all the difficulties included we just got to keep on keep on going keep on going you know yeah thank, thank you, you. Donna, how do you, how comfortable do you feel about saying something about what you want to grow? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm still trying to like process what it is that I want to grow really. Um, I have two different teams I lead, one in Thorn Bay and one in Nockety, and and then I'm part of another team. And it seems like none of our teams are we're supposed to like all feed into the big team and it doesn't seem like we're not as cohesive. And if we're not cohesive, then we're doing an injustice to the children that we serve. And, um, and I want to somehow in my little corner of my two little teams, if I can somehow grow us better and to be more effective and more connected to each other, then we will make more of an impact in the lives that we serve. And then maybe that will feed into our bigger team. Beautiful. Absolutely love it. All right. So I think that's a, a good ending place, Abby. Um, this is where we're at. So I'm not sure if uh, if you guys know how to take screenshots on your computer. <laughs> you can screenshot this or um, I'm happy to email it to you. And um, resources in the um, chat also can link. Oh yeah, third. Yes, I can do that. So I will do that. <laughs> if it will work for me. There we go. Perfect. Okay, did that work? Yeah. yeah. So then if you, okay. if you click on that link, link that it will download so you have that. Um, yeah. So thank okay. you so much, and Tina. Did you have something else that you wanted to add? Sorry. No, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to share one more thing. Okay. So people can take this. So in talking about things that we want to grow, um, positive change we want to generate, we it's helpful to kind of make in this defined topic, right? And so I am sending a list of verbs and adjectives to create this cool, like, pretend like it's a tagline for a newspaper or like, this is going to be my vision in words of the change that's about to come. Sorry, my printer's printing for some reason. Some must, some must be printing something. So um, use that. and. That's what we'll start with next time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I will, um, I'll be, I'll be sharing out on Facebook as well um, with some, with some keys for next week.
So thank you so much, Sheena. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And I look forward to continuing the conversation about appreciative inquiry and the um, various change efforts that we are all undertaking in our, in our own systems and our little world. So thank you all for joining us and I love you all and have a wonderful weekend. Mwah. You too. Bye.